On tonight's CTV News, a prototype for a low emission log burner has gone cold with ECAN. CPIT trade students are moving with the times and the construction fencing industry is booming in Christchurch. This is CTV News, I'm Grant Mangan. For more than a decade, Rangiora's Roger Best has developed downdraft wood burners, a low emission technology designed to burn without smoke and heat the home. It's been a long fight for Roger Best, but for this determined Rangiore engineer, the battle is not over yet. Since the year 2000, Roger Best has been creating the downdraft burner and ultra-low emission wood burner. The emissions from wood burners is identified as one of the major constraints for high air pollution. Installing a log burner into a Christchurch home was made illegal in 2002. Environment Canterbury have cracked down on the use of burners citywide. Because of government regulations, the region is only allowed to have a maximum of three high pollution days a year until September 2016. Following the release of ECAN's air plan for 2014, Roger Best is calling for a review of the ideas using modern technology and measures. To see them base their, their air plan on science, proper science and engineering. That's what I want to see. The downdraft burner is the tenth model of its kind. Created by Best, the burner has three doors. The first is the combustion chamber. But we also need access to there when we're priming it, if you like, when we're putting our first charge of fuel and we need to have access in the bottom end here, underneath the grate, which is in here. The defining feature is the low emissions, which means the entire operation is completed start to finish without smoke. The consequence is the ash pit, which would need to be cleaned out regularly. The bulk of the ash is dropped out and we clean, clean out from that point. In the top end here, we have a large fuel storage chamber in which we, we fill right to the top. We fill that whole chamber down to the grate with wood, as much as we can stuff in there. Roger Best says his burner has 10 times less the emissions than Environment Canterbury's recommended figure. What stopped Roger Best and Environment Canterbury from moving forward was they couldn't come to an agreement on the test method. Best has successfully tested his burners since the early 2000s, but was rejected because it wasn't in accordance to the New Zealand regulated test. Although, in 2003, Angie Scott trialled the ECAN 10-year-old recommended test method and concluded the test was unrealistic. The burners that are now going in as a permitted activity aren't a 0.5 gram burner or a 0.2 gram burner or even a 1 gram burner. There are three or four or five or more gram burners. That's why they haven't made the impact on the, on the emissions in Christchurch City that they would have liked. Battling back and forth for more than a decade, submission after submission, Roger Best is fed up and frustrated. He says after so long, it's time something was done. And I got to the stage where my patience is getting very short. I've spent 15 years on this now. We should have been in production 10 years ago at least. And we're still messing around with silly rules and silly people who know nothing often. They're getting so-called experts come in to advise them who know nothing about combustion engineering. When CTV News asked to speak to the Commissioner, Environment Canterbury pointed us to their air plan, which states ultra-low emission burners are encouraging to be developed but have not quite met the expectations of their standards. Joel Batista, CTV News. Christchurch is in the middle of a $50 billion rebuild and there's money to be made. Where there's construction, there's fencing. Marcus Gibbs takes a look at an industry that's been rapidly expanding in the foreground. The art centre, the Christchurch Cathedral, Hagley Oval, even the city's roadworks. Each of these projects have something in common. It's the fencing. Every major project and even the minor ones have to be fenced off before the men in hard hats can move on to the site. Fahe Fence Hire is one of the larger companies in the fencing game. There were just six before the earthquakes, but with a high demand for temporary fencing, that figure has ballooned to more than 20. And all of them, are, you know, sort of profess to be the best and the smartest. And, you know, my yards are empty because we are pretty good at what we do. We're averaging probably between 35 and 40 jobs a day. Uh, 
think this week we've probably been averaging 1.5 to 2 kilometres per day. Mark took over the company 12 years ago. Since the earthquakes, his stock has more than doubled in size. He has well over 90 kilometres of fencing, and most of it is sitting around dangerous buildings. If it all came back in today, then you know the satellites would show a big piece of steel, <laughs> um, and we'd probably fill AMI Stadium probably three times. Around the city, there's about 200,000 kilometres of fencing. The high demand has meant the only way to get ahead is to have more fencing out on the roads than any of the other companies. It's still the same metre rate and all our costs have gone up but with competition coming in and they sort of drive the price down. The market isn't as lucrative as one might think. Following the earthquakes, the government and the city council invested in about 30 kilometres of fencing. This has been used to protect any damaged public buildings. Cup and show week in October is huge and chews up about 30,000 kilometres of far haze fencing each year. When a company is blocking off a demolition site, it goes without saying there are going to be some casualties. Some of these fences can be fixed up and repaired in this workshop. However, this twisted pile of metal is a write-off. A digger decided to open the gate by smashing through it. It's not the only loss the company has faced. Directly after the February 2011 earthquake, the company lost about half a million dollars of stock. A lot of the gear was in the central CBD and, and was under buildings and that. What will happen when the rebuild winds down? The Fahe team have plans in place to get rid of their excess stock. Instead of it being 100% recyclable for 20, 30 years, with the stuff that I, I, I purchased now from England, it, it has a two to three year shelf life. So as we start going through the years of purchase, they should wiggle themselves out of the market. The team can't imagine the rebuild slowing down for at least another decade. This is the boom time to be in the fencing industry. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. And speaking of boom times, CPIT is now teaching trade students to build with steel frames, a reflection that the way a home is built is changing with the times. The Canterbury rebuild has provided many opportunities for those entering the construction industry. And now carpentry students are learning a new style of building. This steel framed home is being built on CPIT's trade campus. The first time the students are working with this material. The steel framing is uh, getting a, a bigger slice of the market, so um, it's going to be a more uh, relevant sort of material that they're going to be working with in the future. CBIT has become one of the first educational facilities in the country to add steel framed construction to its curriculum. Carpentry students at the Polytech are being given a hands on experience constructing houses using steel frames. As well as learning to build the generic timber framed homes, the tutors are hoping the students will be able to use their skills elsewhere in the industry. I think in days gone by we've worked predominantly in timber and, and you get used to working in those materials so to come across something new uh, can be a bit scary and people are slow to change. The popularity of building with steel is steadily growing, with 8% of homes being built with the frames compared to just 1% six years ago. Some traditional builders are converting to, to steel framing because it's lighter, you know, it's a third of the weight of, of timber, so it's very, very good. You know, the older builders sometimes get bad backs, um, as we all do when we get older, but um, some of them are converting. Building with steel frames is dimensionally accurate, and it performs well in fire and earthquakes. It could only be a matter of time before more of the housing market is being built in steel. Emma Cropper, CTV News. Coming up, work is underway to resolve the city's flooding issues. Today is World Refugee Day. Marcus Gibbs spoke to some of Christchurch's refugees to find out how hard it was to integrate into a new society with a different way of living. Tonight, hundreds of Christchurch refugees will gather to mark their arrival to New Zealand. Every taxpayer uh, in the country provides these services and they're so grateful for it. So tomorrow will be a celebration of where they've come from, how they've progressed and how they've settled and resettled in New Zealand. It's no secret that many countries around the world aren't as fortunate as here in New Zealand. There are ongoing conflicts in Syria, South Sudan, the Central African Republic and now Iraq. More than 2.8 million people have so far fled Syria alone. 
Stories of foreign war and poverty plaster television screens most nights. And for millions of people, these scenes are more than just stories, their day-to-day -day life. At the moment there are 15 million refugees awaiting repatriation to somewhere in the world. New Zealand's one of only 20 countries that accept refugees and um, we punch above our weight as a country um, to receive refugees and resettle them. Since 1995, the Christchurch-based Pito Multicultural Learning Centre has helped students integrate into New Zealand society. This year the school is teaching English to 250 students, many of them refugees. In this classroom they come together to learn and share. About 80% of the students will find full-time work when they finish. They've got many obstacles to overcome in terms of language and uh, resettling, uh, thinking about um, a new environment, the memories that they've got, whatever experiences they've had in the past, we, we don't fully recognise all of the difficulties that they have gone through, but these are all hurdles to resettling in a new place. Just recognise that refugees are not inherently a burden to the country. Most get work and they really contribute and they also contribute to the cultural fabric of our city and our country. These students have only recently arrived in New Zealand. Their English skills aren't great, but they show promise and a will to learn. Each year New Zealand accepts about 750 refugees. Since the earthquakes, no refugees have been accepted into Christchurch. This is due to the severe housing shortage, just one of many issues these students face. Housing is a big one. Language um, is always a big issue because people just need language to function in basic daily life, whether it be going to a doctor, finding a flat, going shopping. The New Zealand Red Cross is marking this year's World Refugee Day by encouraging people to extend a warm welcome to the refugees working in their communities. The Red Cross is also urging New Zealand's health agencies to plan, advocate and address the health needs of former refugees. Their initiatives in health are just fantastic. And by health, it's not just physical health, but it's mental health, social health, the whole sociology of resettling. Marcus Gibbs, CTV News. Emma Cropper has an update on the Christchurch City Council's plans to stop the city from flooding. This work is hoped to improve the capacity of the stormwater network, reducing flooding in Christchurch's Flockton Basin, all done by removing constraints in the lower Dudley Creek. Uh, that included the Guild Street culvert, which is a pedestrian way, but that causes a constraint in the waterway. Water backs up behind it, means it can't get away, contributes to the flooding. The work includes stabilising the bank to make the channel wider, with similar work set to begin on Chancellor Street, which also suffers from constraints in the lower Dudley Creek. But that work will mean no road access for the public, with cul-de-sacs either side of the creek. There will be a pedestrian bridge put back, uh, and then the, the replacement culvert and bridge will come sometime in the future. Widening the culverts is just one of the short-term fixes by the Christchurch City Council. With a bit of Kiwi ingenuity and the use of a local resident's backyard, this pumping system has been put in place to save Flockton streets from drowning underwater. The council spent four and a half million dollars installing 15 of these temporary pumps around the worst affected areas in Christchurch, hoping to save 129 homes from severe flooding. The system will block off an underground pipe, making way for water being pumped from the Flockton Basin. But what this does is it blocks off um, the pipe that goes all the way back up through Flockton Street, Francis Ave and beyond into St Albans and then we pump out through here into Dudley Creek and by doing that we drain or we preserve this capacity in this pipe purely for, for Flockton Basin. These short term solutions will help in heavy rainfall but won't keep away scenes like this if another big storm hits the city. They will always, there's always a risk of flooding problems because we're just doing the design to the 1 in 50 year return period event. So if we get an enormous storm, uh, we still could have some residual risks. So let's be clear about that. We can't design for every storm that, might, that nature might throw at us. And the price tag on these short term solutions is coming at a small cost to the council. The, the, the Guild Street, it's around 90, uh, be, be under $100,000. Uh, the Chancellor Street will be a little more than that, quite a 
lot more than that, maybe a couple of hundred thousand. The, the Tay Street drain, 4.35 was the estimate for that work. So all in all, these, these immediate works are costing around six million. These solutions are part of the mayoral flooding task force, who was set up to produce a report for the council, outlining options for short, medium and long-term flood protection work in the worst affected areas of the city. With these already in place, that task force is now being disestablished on the 30th of June. Don't forget there's a land drainage recovery program that's still looking at the longer term, the big fixes into the, into the future. With the winter well underway, it's hoped these solutions will help protect against any flooding through the wet days and winter. Emma Cropper, CTV News. And still to come, the sport, traffic and weather updates. Here's Gordon with a preview of the weekend's sporting action. Country Rugby takes a spotlight again this weekend, with Dan Carter set to turn out again for Southbridge in their combined country playoff match against the Burnham Dunsandal Irwell club site. A 2,000 strong crowd turned out to support Carter and Southbridge last weekend, which saw the club bar having to be restocked during the week in anticipation of another strong turnout for the returning All Black. After playing 40 minutes in last weekend's match against Glenmark, Carter's workload is expected to increase tomorrow, with him being expected to get 60 minutes of play. The Canterbury Rams head to the road again this weekend as they take the journey south to take on the defending champs, the Southland Sharks in Invercargill tonight, before facing the Otago Nuggets in Dunedin on Sunday. The Rams will once again be forced to get the job done without one of their most influential scorers, with American import Glenn Dandridge still out of action with an elbow injury. The Rams will be looking to get at least a second road win of the season after they got their first win outside of Canterbury last weekend against the Pistons, with the team all chipping in with the absence of Dandridge, who is currently averaging a team high of 18.9 points per game. Dandridge will be hoping to be fit for the Rams' final game of the season, which is at Cal Stadium next weekend. Some of the world's best squash players will be on display this weekend at the Christchurch International Open. Australia's Mike Corrin and the Czech Republic's Jan Kokel are seen as the men to beat with competitors from 12 different nations competing at the Burnside Club for the $5,000 purse. Local hopes will lay with Andrew Ellis, who has been granted a wild card for the event, and will take on the sixth-seeded Englishman Andrew Murrells in the first round. Both the quarter and semi-finals will be played tomorrow, with the final at 3pm on Sunday. The Hawkins Cup Metro Rugby competition moves into the second phase of the season this weekend, with the top six teams battling it out for the Hawkins Trophy, while the rest will still have their eyes on the plate and bowl trophies which are up for grabs. This weekend's trophy competition sees Hawkins Cup winners Lincoln University looking to back up their recent success with a win at Sydenham, while Christchurch, who snuck into the sixth spot, have a tough task when they take on New Brighton. The other match sees Marist Albion at home to high school old boys. And finally tonight, to the Press Cup where this weekend's featured schoolboy rugby game sees Burnside at home to Nelson College. Coverage of the match can be seen right here on CTV this Sunday, with coverage at 12pm and a replay at 5.30. You're up to date with the latest in local sport. I'm Gordon Finlater for CTV Sport. If you're driving around the Christchurch Central City, CTV's traffic update will assist you navigating the repairs taking place. Hello travellers, to help you plan your journey around the Central City, here's a few tips. Next week new skirt work will be starting on Colombo Street. This starts on Monday at the intersection of Colombo Street and Chom Street. 
This means no north and southbound traffic will be able to cross the Chum Street, Colombo Street intersection. Traffic will be able to turn left and right west from Chum Street into Colombo Street. Chum Street remains closed between Colombo and Manchester Streets. Traffic moving north up Colombo Street will be detoured down St Asaph Street and onto Montreal. To keep up to date on what's happening with the Central City Roads, as always, keep watching CTV News first at 5, and in the meantime, visit the Transport for Christchurch website. So, will we be having an indoors or an outdoors weekend? Let's find out with your regional weather. Kia ora everyone. Well the sun was out around Canterbury today, let's see what those temperatures were. Down in Timaru, you had 11 degrees today, Tamuka and Geraldine both on 12 degrees. Ashburton, 11 degrees for you. Methven reached 11 degrees. Rakaia also on 11 degrees. Darthfield, 11 degrees out there. Darthfield, 11 degrees out there. Leeston and Rolleston had 11 degrees today. And Lincoln also had a high of 11 degrees. Christchurch, there was plenty of sun about for you today as well. Over in Akaroa, 11 degrees was your high. And out north of the Waimak, Kaipui, Rangiora and Amberley all on 12 degrees. Taking a look inland, Colverton and Hamna Springs, you were both on 12 degrees today and 12 degrees in Cheviot. And up along the east coast, Kaikoura reached a high of 12 degrees. Timidu, high cloud and fresh westerly winds in the morning. Colder southwesterlies developing during the afternoon with a few showers possible. Tonight's low 5 degrees, tomorrow's high 13 degrees. Ashburton, fine at first with mild westerly winds and high cloud, but cold southwesterlies may bring brief showers mid afternoon. Tonight's low 4 degrees, tomorrow's high 14. Mostly fine in Christchurch for Saturday, mild at first with high cloud increasing and westerly winds developing, but cooler southwesterlies spreading north during the afternoon with a risk of light showers. Kaikoura, mostly fine and mild with fresh winds and high cloud. Cooler southwesterly is developing from evening. Tonight's low 4 degrees, tomorrow's high 15 degrees. The rest of Canterbury can also expect a fine Saturday. Let's take a look at the temperatures. Tamuka and Geraldine can expect a high of 14 degrees. Methvin, you can expect 14 degrees and 14 is expected in Rakaia. Darfield, you have 14 degrees set for tomorrow, and Leeston, 15 degrees for you. Rolleston and Lincoln, 15 degrees for you also, and over in Akaroa, yes that's right, 15 degrees is your high for Saturday. Out in North Canterbury, some cloud around for Kaipui, Rangiora and Amberley, all on 15 degrees. Hamner Springs and Shivia, a nice day with you with some cloud about and a high of 15 degrees. Looking ahead for Canterbury, becoming fine and sunny on Sunday with southwesterly winds dying out, northeasterlies developing. Mostly fine and sunny on Monday with light northeasterlies, northeasterlies freshening on Tuesday with high cloud increasing later in the day, fresh gusty northeasterly winds on Wednesday with mostly cloudy skies, some brief rain spreading off the western ranges during the afternoon, then winds tending northwesterly. Fresh, gusty, cooler westerlies and a mix of sunny periods and high cloud on Thursday. And that's your weather for Friday. Have a great evening and a lovely weekend. Well, that's a very encouraging forecast for the week ahead. And that's CTV News for Friday and the week. I'm Grant Mangan. Good night. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air.